Hello, everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Welcome to our 21st episode of DGC Masterclass via Zoom. These are unprecedented times beyond anyone's imagining, which makes me even more grateful that you are joining us here tonight. The DGC recently posted this statement. The DGC is an organization that is strengthened by the talents and passion of diverse creatives and crew. We stand together in solidarity with the black community and all those who still face discrimination and hate to fight, to fight for a society free of systemic racism. Black Lives Matter. With these masterclasses, we are going behind the scenes and talking to some of the top creatives in the industry in Canada and internationally, covering directors, designers, picture and sound editors with two episodes every week. You'll receive a new invitation with a specific link to tune in, and I'm also posting the links on my Instagram. So far, we've had Emmy-winning director Jean-Marc Vallée, Emmy-winning editor Kelly Dixon, Oscar-winning designers David and Sandy Wasco, a special event with brilliant award-winning filmmaker Jeff Barnaby, two-time Oscar-nominated doc filmmaker Faraz Fayyad, two-time Oscar-winning sound editor Karen Baker-Landers, Oscar and Palm d'Or nominee Adam Agoyan, Oscar-nominated designers K.K. Barrett and Patrice Vermette, Maverick filmmaker Bruce McDonald, Oscar-nominated director, writer, producer, and actor Sarah Pauly, groundbreaking director Clement Virgo in conversation with Cameron Bailey, history-making 2019 Academy Award-winning production designer Hannah Beekler, prolific director and actor Helen Shaver, Oscar-winning legendary Star Wars picture editor Paul Hirsch, award-winning groundbreaking director Mina Shum, renowned director, writer, and actor Casey Lemons, a special edition celebrating the release of Christian Sparks' sophomore film, Hammer, world-renowned production designer Claude Paré, and Emmy-nominated director, writer, and producer, producer Vina Sood. All those can be found on the DGC National and DGC Ontario YouTube channels. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator. He's directed 11 feature films, over 70 episodes of television, and over 160 music videos. He was nominated for a DGC award for Trailer Park Boys in 2015, and he's a double, double Emmy nominee for Odd Squad in 2017 and 2018, and won a BAFTA for his episode Negative Town in 2019. He's the first person of color and youngest DGC member to be elected as the DGC's National Directors Division Chair in 2017. He's thrilled to unveil his new passion project movie, Things I Do For Money to the World in August of this year. Welcome, Warren P. Sonoda. Thank you, Hans. There he is. Welcome. Glad to have you here. I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's featured guest. He's an Emmy-nominated, BAFTA award-winning director and showrunner, and is CEO of Mad Rabbit, a Red Arrow Studios company. Most recently, she was pilot, multi-episode director, and executive producer of Showtime's limited series, as brilliant, The Loudest Voice, starring Russell Crowe as Roger Ailes. Presently, she's executive producer and director of all six episodes of the Falcon and the Snow and <laughs> Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You're dating Snow. yourself, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> that was also a great movie, but Kari didn't direct that one. Uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier for Marvel. Uh, she's won several awards for her work as director on the hit series The Handmaid's Tale, which were all brilliant, and is recognized for the pilot episodes of AMC's Nosferatu, starring Zach Zachary Quinto and the pilot of stars, The Rook. She has become one of the world's most prolific female directors of one-hour dramas and feature films. She was named one of The Hollywood Reporter's 10 directors to watch for her auteur debut, won a prestigious BAFTA award for directing The Handmaid's Tale season one finale, which was amazing. Nominated for a 2018 Emmy Award for outstanding directing for a drama series for The Handmaid's Tale season two. And most recently, The Loudest Voice, was nominated for a Golden Globe uh, Best Miniseries and won Best Actor for Russell Crowe. If you haven't seen it, watch that show. It's amazing. She was also featured in Variety's 2018 Women's Impact Report. Welcome, Kari Skoglin. There she is. Kari. So I, I'm blushing, but thank you for that. <laughs> 
incredible intro. <laughs> Pleasure to have you both here, an absolute thrill. Now, before I turn it over to Warren Kari, I'd like to direct our viewers to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to send in questions throughout the masterclass using that button, type them in there. Warren will be watching those questions and he'll try to get to as many of them as possible throughout. He may not be able to get to all of them, but he will try. That's it for me. Warren and Kari have a fabulous conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Over to you. Thank you so much, Hans. Kari, how are you doing? I, I you know, uh, there's a little bit of a cheat here because I have seen you recently. You were one of the first people I was able to socially distance with. I know, we did, we did, I have a nice roof deck and we did an outdoor roof deck. Yes, but uh, it's tumultuous times, obviously, uh, with the world um, um, sort of um, finally uh, awakening to Black Lives Matter and anti-Black racism. Uh, we're in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, you're one of those directors that just gravitates to big projects. I hear you, you are directing Falcon in the Winter Soldier, and I think that's where we can start and end that NDA conversation. Yeah, I love, I love NDAs, but I can tell you I feel incredibly pri privileged to be part of a project that is so incredibly relevant right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it is one of the many, I hope, coming not only from Marvel, but from all over the world, is starting to move the needle and really look at these issues in a meaningful way. Well, and these issues are, are really coming to fore uh, recently. I mean, in the last six weeks, obviously. Um, but you were uh, sort of right in the middle of, a, of the last time I really remember the world sort of waking up to the things, and that was uh, during the Me Too movement. And the loudest voice, I think, is uh, a, a a pretty good indictment of what happened uh, there. Do you see any similarities now to what's happening in the world with, with uh, what you remember happening for the last five years? Well, you know, I, obviously, I, I kind of feel the Me Too movement has happened a couple of times. And I yeah, hope yes. Time, I hope this time it, it sticks because I came out of the 70s where uh, we were expected as young women to be CEOs and have families and uh, you know there was affirmative action and um, there was very much a racial conversation going on at that time and um, uh, somehow we slipped and we kind of you know by the 90s Anita Hill could happen and right. uh, so I, I hope this time I definitely in terms of my career um, path there was a sudden kickstart if I had been you know, kind of bumping up against that ceiling, uh, which I, I've never really acknowledged, honestly. I've always kind of felt like you have to, um, if you acknowledge something too much, it becomes real and therefore it, you, you uh, sort of self-edit. Right, sure. Yeah, I've kind of always just said, no, I'm just gonna go for it. Having said that, there's lots of decisions that are made that are, you can't explain other than it's sort of the status quo still operating. The Me Too would sort of kick the shit out of that. And suddenly um, I, I, was, I had access to projects that I did not have access to before. Do, do, you, do you remember a specific moment or how, it, like, is there a moment where you really felt something change or uh, something was different? By people either talking to you or meeting with you? No, I guess, you know, probably it was the sudden volume of sheer volume of work that was coming my way because I've had I've done enough work in in the years leading up to me too there was a sensibility on some of the uh, bigger shows to um be inclusive actually I'm going to dial it back one one step uh it without it being me too or any kind of um gender or racial agenda Back in, uh, it was a while ago, now, six, or, six or seven years, six years anyway, um, I got a call from, uh, in fact, I ran into Sheila, Hawk, Sheila Hawken, mm -hmm. and she said, well, what are you working on these days? And at that particular time, I, I, um, I wasn't, I can't remember what it was, but I had a bit of a gap. And, and uh, she said, oh my God, and I really want to uh, bring you into to the version. Yes. I knew a bunch of the 
players because I had worked on one of my films, uh, 50 Dead and Walking. I worked with who was now a producer. Um, she was on producing at that time and so on. And it was an Irish film. So Neil Jordan had seen the film and really liked it. So there was kind of, you know, it's the synergy of work the gets work. And, and you, you very much have to pay attention to that um, as you go through your, uh, the, your choices. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I had probably the worst interview I've ever had with me. <laughs> you couldn't figure out. This, we for the, this was for the Borgias. Before and, the Borgias. And was this before or after Boardwalk? This was before Boardwalk. Okay. Well, actually, it was the first of the big shows. You know, if you think of Borgias and Boardwalk, now Board, Boardwalk was only one season in. Anyway, it was the, the very first of that, what I called at the time, um, I forget what I called it, something like uh, big entertainment, but- uh, Event television. Uh, entertainment, yeah, but on, right. on the small box. It was yes. Extraordinary, right? And I came back from that and I said to a friend of mine, a producer friend of mine here in Ontario, because I wasn't really working that much in, in Canada at that point even. And I said, oh my God, the world just changed. You know, I was working with Oscar winning actors, with Oscar winning costume designers, with real budgets. I mean, the show was beautiful. Um, and because at the time there was a co-production, um, you know, it was financed in part by the Canadian co-production, Canadian Irish co-production um, mm -hmm. world, uh, there, the, the one sort of affirmative action part of it was they had to have so many Canadians on it. And so that's I, a pretty good action. I like that action. Well, <laughs> it time, right? It was the only way to get international work. Yes. And so I ended up folding into that show and doing a, a couple of years of it and um, loving every, every second of it. It was extraordinary. And, and you know, it was the first production to be shooting in Hungary of this kind of ilk. Now right. it's, 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 now it's, it's kind of normal. Yeah. It was just the beginning of all that. And um, it, it rocked my world, I have to say. And, and so that though, that decision had nothing to do with gender, had nothing to do with a, you know, any of what we're talking about. It merely had to do with quality of work and that I was a right fit. Oh, and I had a Canadian passport. So there was that, right? Um, and Neil liked me, even though we had a terrible interview. I, I and it was terrible. We, could, we couldn't get the Skype working. What, what made it? What? Yeah. What made it? Was it uncomfortable oh, or yeah. just? Lovely. He's a lovely, lovely man. <laughs> and so he was trying to use Skype. I was trying to use Skype, and and it, it, we, he was in Docky, where he lives, where, where the internet is terrible, right? Okay. Okay. And so we couldn't quite sync it up, and it was it was one of those where it got all about. The, the tech of it and and, sure. uh, and not about the actual yes. connection going, oh my god i blew that, I blew that. <laughs> anyway when, when sheila called me and um and i credit sheila for being a champion of so many directors uh, and other talent uh and craft uh in in canada she has been a spearhead of um getting us outside the box and outside the country uh, and working on these, these productions because of her role um, with all these internationally huge productions. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was kind of the first. So then from that, I started, oh, you know, then Boardwalk, I guess I, I came out of, you know, Borgia's okay. So then Boardwalk wanted, so I became a bit of a token, uh, but I was okay with that, it didn't matter. Um, right. But I was always in the middle, right? You, I'd be like episode five or six because episode five or six, you can't really fuck it up. And if you do fuck it up, they'll just come in and reshoot a whole bunch of stuff. So they kind of feel like, oh, well, you know. Okay. But I managed to, to sort of ratchet up some very good credits and work with some very good people and meet. Was there, was there initial pushback to have a, a, a female director directing these shows? Uh, Cause you, in a, in a way you're a trailblazer getting on um, these, these very big shows early on and um, really set up uh, the ability to I found it so comfortable because in Europe did not, that I think by, by definition, um, as a more matriarchal kind of society, particularly in the Irish society and so on, they just didn't have the, the uh, same, you know, barriers. And so I, I came on set and I did, never felt particularly um, discriminated against at all, or, or, you know, they just accepted me as the position 
that That's I good. had, the role I had. And I, I don't remember. Now, it's quite possible it was there, but like I said before, uh, right. I, I don't look at that. So it, blow, it kind of blows past me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've taken issue with it a couple of times, of course, but um, typically I just let it blow past because, right. you, just, it, it, you know, you move on. Because it, it can also be just a cantankerous person. You know, it, it can be about anything. It can be right. something that's uh, otherwise defined. So, um, but the, 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 as a result of that one opportunity uh, that was an international based show that showed up very well uh, in the awards and all that, I suddenly had some street cred in the US. And right. so suddenly I was, I was the one who could they could call and put in that middle thing and go, oh yeah, we've got, and be, by the way, I also did 15 years of um, working with the DGA on their women's steering committee as a co-chair right. uh, to help promote women. And uh, I was uh, I was part of um, WIF here. I didn't do it when I moved to LA, I wasn't on WIF there, but um, I was very involved with the DGA right. in promoting women uh, and trying to get them kickstart. And believe me, we failed. We absolutely failed. Why do you say that? Well, we couldn't, I, no matter what we did. Uh, you couldn't move the needle? We could not move the needle. So yeah. we, we, we did very big um, uh, functions to introduce people to introduce people. And I remember this was when I said, right, this is not ever going to work the way it is. So we had done this big evening and uh, which was kind of like a speed dating evening, but, um, and we had it down. I mean, we, we did these uh, every like three or four months and we had this, Huge evening with, and there was like you know, Aaron Sorkin, and all the big right. show. And I won't say who. <laughs> Running up to, so I was standing there because I had co-chaired and, and been part of the, the creating the event. Sure. And as uh, showrunner came up and said, "Oh, oh, um, I just saw uh, so and so, and you know, she's Asian, and she's a she, and that means we get it." And I said, what's a twofer? And he said, well, like, you know, it's a diverse hire, but it's a twofer. And of course I was gobsmacked, right? Like I was like, I honestly didn't even know what to say. And then he said, and you know, the DGA really should pay for some of these, some of these people. So I said, so someone like myself who's done, at that time I'd done like four or five features, four yeah. or five pilots, four or five television movies, because in those days we did television. I said, you would want the DGA to pay for me to come on your set and I would have to mentor, oh, by the way, I'd have to work under another person and mentor for a da da da, and they, we'd pay for that. And I'm, you wouldn't necessarily give me an episode, but you'd pay me to mentor and then maybe give me an episode. That's what you're saying? And he said, yeah, wouldn't that work? And I, I literally walked over to, I can't remember who the president was at the time, and said, that's it, it's done. There's right. no way into the television industry for women in this stage. Mm -hmm. So we then focused on features. And we switched it because the way in, which was my path, I had done a couple of features that I- Size of watermelons, Rob Stefanik. Getting <laughs> with Paul Rudd and, you know, and um, at, which we all look on fondly as a sophomore movie as it was, it was a blast to do and we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, shot it in 10 days, you know, you know the, you know the story. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we, folk, we started, we switched, our, we switched gears to focus on getting women with some street cred because they had done, a, you know, an independent film and, and right. so on to, to look at that as the way to get into the television industry um, as, as a way to make a living. Um, that was working ish. Not really. Numbers were not changing. It was still 10%, 11% tops. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right around the me too movement when we, as women, we started getting phone calls saying, I, I have to admit, I never got one, but I had heard that it was happening, of um, people sort of coming in to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And this was now legally, because like, it, it was illegal what was going on. If you just look straight hiring practices, if 50% of the population is female and only 10% of them are working in the industry, there's something wrong with that number, right? Yeah. So then studios started getting a little nervous and then it sort of kicked off from there. So, and then as Weinstein came down and all that, so 
I can't, that, that was a long-winded way of telling you around it happening, but so it wasn't a date so much as a twist. And it was the legal push as a result right. of all of these other intersecting events that then suddenly I was getting phone calls. I couldn't get arrested to do a pilot, even right. though I had some big creds. And then suddenly I was getting, you know, calls left, right, and center to do pilots. So that I, I, I remember that being the okay, there's some, I don't know, something in the wind just completely changed. <laughs> I remember in 2017 when the Directors Guild of Canada uh, teamed up with Dr. Amanda Coles to do the paper, Who's Sitting in the Director's Chair? And it, in stark numbers, uh, gave out the data of, I, yeah, I think it was 11%. Don't quote me on it. I'll have to check uh, the report. Yeah, but it was in that, those, that range, yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and now we're going to be uh, looking at BIPOC numbers and uh, uh, the same sort of data points will probably come up. Um, but what I found sort of extraordinary in your story was you just never stopped. You, you, you found, you pivoted pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, I think you have to, well, first of all, work, as we've talked about, work begets work. Mm -hmm. so you have to be careful what you do and what you say yes to, even, even when, you know, you feel vulnerable. Now, having said that, I say, in my, in my career path, I've only recently been in a position where I get to say no. Um, so I said yes to everything. So I'm, I didn't do what I'm say, suggesting you do. <laughs> I just said yes to everything. No, but, 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 but the body of your work suggests that uh, you, you certainly were discerning in terms of the, the way you uh, got in from like you were doing, you know, uh, one hour TV, the listener in Canada, it, it got into the Borgias, which got into um, uh, Boardwalk Empire. And then uh, I, I guess my next question would be, you just brought it up earlier, is pilot directing. Uh, what is the difference between being the, the world builder pilot director uh, and what's sometimes known as an episodic director, a guest director, you know, on, on a series? Well, they're slightly different jobs, basically. Um, and, and if you're doing a pilot, I feel like, I mean, I've always looked at my work as being a feature. I don't think I've ever said I'm doing television. Yes. I remember a producer saying to me, and this was years ago, and I was doing a pilot. Uh, she said, you know, it looks too much like a feature. <laughs> and I, I screamed. <laughs> Is that, that's a bad thing. <laughs> oh, really? Huh. That's changed now, but so whatever that was, um, probably 10 years ago at least, mm -hmm. um, that, that was the sensibility that television, but I never, because I came out of features and it was features that gave me my opportunity in television, um, I think I never turned off that muscle. Sure. So, and 50 Dead Men Walking, I, I think really set you up for the next phase, right? Correct. In terms, yeah. I have to thank, you know, the Canadian government for being a very big part of financing that picture uh, alongside some UK financing. But um, uh, so my point, though, is you decide how it is, what, what your brand is. And I, this, these are not conscious decisions, particularly. But I think I've always gone for the gold, irritatingly. I, I mean, I'm a pain in the ass. People kind of like, you know, just would love me just to not care so much all right. the time. But if you are always going for the goal and always, you know, trying to do the best the project can possibly be, even if you're polishing a turd, you still feel a sense of, of accomplishment because it's better than what mm -hmm. it started. And, and I think you carry that to any project, no matter how big or small, but you get known for that. And I think mm -hmm. I got known for being perhaps a bit annoying because I'm constantly just going for the gold and not really settling. But if that's what you want of a show, then, then, then I'm probably the a right fit. So um, as a result of that, the, the pilot thing became, okay, she's gonna go into the minutia of it and she's going to world build and like, like you would a feature. Cause that's, that's really what you're doing. You're, it's much more, much closer to it. Um, the world of feature making. 
uh, because you're you're building it from the ground up, everything from you know the costumes, the, the casting, and everything. The it, depending on who you're working with, it's more corporate or less corporate. So uh, you know, there's layers and layers, and you have to get good at the politics, which I've never been good at. Right. I, I, you know eventually annoy somebody about something, but it's always for the sake of the, the show. I, you know, that, that's the, I think the, the, the biggest lesson to learn uh, for all of us is keep your ego out of it. If your ego's involved, uh, it, will, it will potentially steer you in, in directions that are hard to get out of, or, or, you know, get nasty. If you're really just trying to do the honest right thing for the show and for the actors, for the, the benefit of, of, um, of the results, uh, without your ego getting, dialing in, then that's, a, that's, that's powerful. Right. And you can't, you can't do anything but make it better if that's really the, the, the you know, pulse power. So I was quite ready for the first pilot I did. Which was, uh, you tell me? Well, Is... I actually- Oh, was... right, okay. <laughs> uh, years ago, but um, uh, then, then I did a pilot for, uh, what was it called, gosh. It was with um, Shattered, did the pilot for that. Okay. Um, but those were Canadian shows, and the Canadian shows did not count in the US. So right. all I've done about four, four pilots in Canada. So when you say that they don't count, are you talking when you go in for your meetings at networks, uh, they, they really want to see the international. They want to see the international work. Okay. Now I think Canada to, to say that today is probably not accurate because the Canadian work, because it's going into Netflix and it's going into, to bigger, you know, it, it's showing up. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I hope that's changed. Mm -hmm. So when you go into a network executive and they have seen the show and it's done fairly well, you know, the shit's creak of it and that, and mm -hmm. the shows that have, have come out of Canada, I think are starting to, 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 um, erase that barrier, but certainly six or seven years ago, uh, the, those credits were not really acknowledged. It had to be a U.S. credit with a U.S. network or, or at that time streamer, you know, like a Netflix or whatever. Um, so the, the thrust, which we've talked about quite a bit is to have a sustaining career. I think now more than ever, you do need to set yourself up for the world stage. Right. Uh, and that requires, you know, trajectories and choosing lanes and choosing shows that are going to show up. And now if, if Canada it is starting to be a gateway for some of that via the, the streamers and via the shows that are selling outside of the country that are meaningful and that you're allowed because that's another thing you're not always allowed to do the best work you can do because it's often dumbed down by process right we've got a lot of layers who everybody has an opinion and sometimes you know arguably you, you think you're you would have done it a different way that you think is better that's what we're paid to do we're paid to try to make it better um so if you're allowed to um really uh, show off your muscle, then it will show up in, in, in the, you know, various parts of the world and you can work. And, you know, what's great is you can work in Europe, you can work in the UK and really start to, um, learn about that. Because when I went to the Borgias, I suddenly, I was working in the 15th century. Not many people had done that at that point, you know. The, the hand and the handful of women, I don't know, two, right. uh, who had worked with horses and big stunts that required, you know, two hundred fifty horses running at you, you know, with spears, uh, and uh, you know, uh, just the the magnitude of what I was suddenly doing and learning was fantastic. And then, you know, I had come off of Fifty Dead Men, where I met all these marvelous filmmakers. Um, and, and, you know, how it, it all comes around, right? Because my, my second unit director, um, uh, stunt, the second unit director was my stunt coordinator on, my st second unit director on this project that I'm working on now was my stunt coordinator on um, 50 Dead Men. And he had caught Batman at that point. 
And, you know, right, and so you just weave a bigger, you feel like you can put together a bigger, better crew. Right. From, you know, plucking from international scope. Uh, it, it, we uh, got our first Q&A question in. Please put your Q&As into the, uh, the Q&A uh, function. Uh, I see a lot of uh, directors out there, so we want to hear from you. Shout out to Ingrid. Gail Harvey's in the house. Uh, hi, hi, Gail. Uh, my dad is listening, so I hope you're getting something out of this, Roy. Uh, but Karen Bruce, uh, 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 a friend to the filmmakers out there, asks, um, 50 Dead Men Walking is a fantastic film. But you once mentioned years ago on a panel, you surround yourself with the best people. You don't need to be the best DP, but you need to be the best on your set, whether that be a stunt, hair, makeup, editor. Uh, I've repeated that over the years many times. Uh, her question is, what would you tell a director that wants to break into TV is the key to being successful, other than leaving your ego at the door, which I've heard you say before. But yeah, I guess there's a lot of directors out there. What are some of the things that you would suggest right now in 2020 uh, as a bit of a, 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 a to-do or not to-do list? Well, again, it depends, of course, what you're doing, whether you're um, a producer on the project as well as a director, because that's a, a, got another role to it. Um, but typically... Yeah, let's say, let's say you're just, you've been directing, you maybe have done a, a couple features in Canada, you've done some episodic TV, uh, but you really want to get into, uh, get an HBO show, get, get, you know, what you were talking about in terms of that uh, bigger canvas show. I think, first of all, you have to do your homework. Um, you need to know who you're working with. And that means anecdotal homework, too. That means phoning up people and saying, so, you know, you were working with so-and-so. What was that like? Can you right. help what not to do and what to do? Because... Um, you know, you're dealing with, if you're not a veteran, mm -hmm. and you don't know the pitfalls, then you've got to figure out hopefully where the cracks in the road are going to be before you hit them. So, um, you know that if the, if, you know, the head writer starts scratching his head or her head, that yep. means you're getting pissed off. And you know that, right? So, uh, you can figure that out. Um, so homework is, is key. Being prepared right. is key. So, you know, I've heard of situations where um, directors come in and go, so what are we gonna do today? And they probably have an idea what they're gonna do today, but everybody wants to feel it, it because we, particularly in Canada, um, oh, everywhere, the, the schedules can be so punitive. You have to come in really knowing your shit. But by the way, it seems like everybody else on the set also knows your shit. Right. So they all have an opinion about what you're doing or not doing right or wrong. And so you can't, you can't let that get to you, you know, because like <laughs> all the time, and I'm sure this happens to all directors, you know, you go, okay, so got this great idea, blah, 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 we're gonna do this and that. And you can watch seven people, you know, kind of roll their eyes like, oh my God, I can't Right, that. right. But how, do you, how do you combat against that? What do you do? You don't, you don't. You just, you just resolve yourself to go, ah, it, it'll be a good idea. You watch, it'll, it'll work. Right. Because if it doesn't work, then you've got to also be the first one to say, okay, bad idea. Sorry guys, let's go back to what we were doing. But they'll, everybody will respect the fact that you had the, the guts to try, right? If you, if you cave under the, you know, the glare of the, oh, do you really, are you, or worse, you know, oh, that's going to cost 15 minutes. Do you want to spend the 15 minutes to do R&D on that? Are you sure? And you're <laughs> like, yeah. I remember one time I, I was shooting, I was in New York and I was shooting this show and the sun was coming down, you know, we were between buildings and it was incredibly cold. And, Anyway, the sun was coming down between buildings and I was having real trouble getting the blocking right on this and that where the camera was going and stuff, it was just not working. It just wasn't feeling right. And I, I so now we've dug in 20 minutes to try and get it right, get the cameras there and everything else. And I turned around, I literally, literally did one of these, oh, there's the shot. And it was partly because the light had changed, you know, this and that. So I said, guys, you know what? I'm really sorry, but um, switching gears, and I'm known for this, and it pisses people off, but honestly, at the end of the day, I don't do it frivolously. Yeah. It's a better shot. So let's go. 
So I knew my timing, right? Like I thought, oh, damn, you know, I spent 20 minutes in the wrong direction. And now we're going to go this direction and everybody's going to be, eh. right. now they don't know I'm thinking that, but that's what I'm thinking. Right. So I go, I go, you know, do that. No, let's, come on, we'll do it. It'll be so much better. And I remember at one point, someone came up and said, so Karen, why the hell would you do that when, you know, we invested, we shot, I don't know, like three takes or something. And I said, did you like that shot? And he said, well, no, not really. And I said, well, that's why we shouldn't do it. Yeah. Because I'm going to sit and post and I'm going to look at that shot and I'm going to kick myself for days, knowing that in that small little moment, I could have done something better and I caved under the pressure of the just get it done yeah. hat. Yeah. And um, it, it's just, I've always kept that little event in my mind that that guy came up to me and said, why would you do that? You know, like I, like I was an idiot. And at, at the end of it, we, we uh, finished, I said, so what do you think? And he was like, okay, you were right. Now that was vindicating, but by the same token, you do have to kind of, you're a leader, that's what you do. So you do have to make the decision and go with it. But if you mess it up, be the first one to say, oops, ah, sorry. You know, uh, you're constantly fighting as a director on set for that moment in the edit suite. That's, that's really what you're fighting for uh, every minute of the day. Well, I started as an editor, right? Yes. So, that's, uh, so I actually shoot for the editing room. Yes. And I, know, I know when I can get myself out of trouble or when I can't. Ish. You know, I, I get a little bit arrogant about that, too. I kind of push the envelope sometimes. I remember I did this show. I did the pilot, actually, for a show called um, Pilot in multiple episodes. Um, uh, it was a banker's show. Um, Traders? Traders. Thank you. Uh, and, um, you know, we kind of studied homicide. And right. those days, you know, it was kind of a, a wild show. So we were trying to... I was trying to juice up a, a banker show. How do you do a merchant banker show and make it interesting, right? Right. So, uh, uh, so I was just messing up with uh, all kinds of crossing my axis and doing it on purpose. And I thought, at one point, I thought, oh, I've actually messed it up. They're actually, I just, I crossed my axis and I didn't cover my, like I, I right. away from that. <laughs> so I called the editor and go, so how's the scene? How's it cutting? And she said, oh, it's great. And I said, hmm, did you notice I crossed my axis and I didn't give you coverage to get around it? And she was like, you did? What? <laughs> she looked, and she was like, you're right. You did. And I thought, you see, you can break the rules. And if it works, if the cut works because the emotion behind it works, boom. Uh, I bet you Tim Southern probably wrote that episode of Traders that you were uh, yeah. shooting. So. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, uh, you, you mentioned something, and I wanted to get into this fairly, as, uh, which was blocking and working with actors. And you know, the one striking thing about your work is it's incredibly visually cinematic. And uh, I want to talk about visuals in a second. But it's, it's always completely anchored by real visceral uh, um, emotional performances. Um, what's your process with working with actors? How do you, how do you talk to actors? How do you uh, block them? What, when you get a scene, uh, how do you start from getting the scripts to uh, interacting with your, with your performers? Well, first of all, thank you for all the kind words. Um, <laughs> what I try to do is in the, uh, you know, in the, in, first of all, obviously I, I read the script, reread the script, uh, through prep, you're, you're really trying to, to absorb the script. But I also try to um, uh, not be too rigid. Sure. Because of course, so much is happening with the locations of various things, and then you're gonna get there and it's gonna be different. So I, I try to have a, 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 it's in a box, but it's not clamped down. Do you, do you have set blockings already in terms of your preparation or when you set? Uh, well, yeah, you know, it, depends on, it depends on the complexity of the scene. Sure. Um, but I, so I then learned, I used to do shot lists way early on. Yep. And then I realized that was, Depending on the scene and the complexity. Let's, this. let's do a little thing here. Uh, I hate to put you on the spot, Kari, but I, I have this kind of um, ready. And um, oh, this, is, this is uh, uh, your award uh, winning um, episode for Handmaid's Tale. And it's the opening sequence. Um, 
uh, to it. And I believe this is episode uh, after. This is uh, uh, season two, episode seven, right? Um, this is the first shot of your entire episode. Yeah. And your first shots are always a story. Uh, yeah. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of walk through this, these shots and maybe you can explain your rationale of how you came up with them vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis working with the actors and actually blocking it. Well, okay, in this case, um, it was quite a complicated uh, series of images that we had to, to navigate because it was a mm -hmm. big park. And it took us a long time to find what this park would be. And finally, I found a, a, a golf course in Hamilton Nice. Where it's going to be um, was going to work for us, and it had to be. And, and I it went through a, a few different, um, you know, the budget was an issue, uh, and it went through a few different, um, big, small, you know, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. But it had to have a, this anonymity to it, and it had to have the red uh, really being stark mm -hmm. against some of the other colors. And it wanted it wanted to be graphic, um, so in this case, I, it was funny because I we we had a, a path that everybody walked. We got very lucky. Yeah. No. This, this one here, right? Yeah. Well, it was yeah. that, and it, it went it wound around, and so right. I had about five shots of this overhead that went along, which was part of this piece of it, and yeah. then another hill, and then, so there were like five locations to get us to this this um, amazing. And I shot it a lot more like a music video where yeah. we, I had boarded it. Um, actually, this one I did board uh, because sometimes doing storyboards is good to communicate um, with the crew what sure. you the overall of what you're thinking. Well, yeah, and I would assume this is all constructed, all these uh, uh, crosses and everything is already. Yeah, we put them on the hill. Right. Um, and so, uh, and we got very lucky, it snowed. Right. And yes, it's beautiful. So had it not snowed, it wouldn't nearly, we would have had to try and manufacture snow in post and that was probably not gonna happen. Right. Um, and then the other thing I did in this case was I gave myself a whole bunch of tools. Okay. I gave myself the Phantom, um, a 50 foot Techno, a drone, right? And all the things that I thought, okay, when we get there, whatever the weather is going to be and whatever the, you know, I've got one day to shoot this, so whatever whatever's going to come at us, we'll have some. I'll have the toys. Mm -hmm. that I have to figure out how to, you know, shoot multiple cameras and get maximize the most of the thing. So if you can imagine, for example, that that thing in the center, mm -hmm. uh, that it was originally black, and when when we went up in a drone and the actor stood on it in her dark costume, you couldn't see her. Yeah, it just so disappears. It, right, and had to put something else on it and. Then it, we didn't have the right stuff because we were out in the field. So then we went and, and cut some branches because I said, you know, the pine branch is a very, it's a, it's a very um, spiritual thing. Blah, blah. So, we, you know, we were making it up as we went to some degree, which you want to do. You yes. Want to have that. Well, and there's, there's a bit of ceremony and choreography also involved in the way yes. you block this, right? Sorry. Yeah. Was there any was, of that rehearsed or was, was it just you showed up at the... This we could not pre-rehearse. Um, I had, I designed this on, uh, I knew what we were going to do, that we were going to do sort of Busby Berkeley kind of mm -hmm. styling to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was a matter of figuring out a move that would look good. <laughs> At one point, Lizzie Moss said to me, I'm not sure about this move, but of course I, I was doing it for the Phantom because I knew what the sure, yeah. would do with it. Um, but it, it did look a little awkward as, as you know, a regular person. Yeah. Uh, so this was a case of a combination of knowing, it, uh, I did an overhead map of knowing where everybody was going to be and end up. Mm -hmm. Obviously we needed to know where, we weren't lighting, um, mm -hmm. so I could put them anywhere. But I, I did have to figure out where the base to the crane would be that I could maximize all the moves. Sure, where, without uh, having to move the base of the crane again. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was gonna be hard. Plus, yeah. we ended up, because it snowed, we had to have uh, we had to have runways in and all that stuff because it was all very slippery. And so, long story short, we were only able to shoot in one direction, which I knew if I had to turn around, right. I would be in trouble. So, right. 
you know, you, you, you check your sun path and you make sure. And that's I, I would imagine there's your entire, oops, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm flying through this, your entire units behind you. So you can't, you can't, you can't really go this way on the, on the camera here. Right? So, so you have yeah. to make sure your blocking is yeah. such that you, that that will work for you. Now, the one extraordinary thing about the sequence is not just the visuals. I mean, obviously it, the visuals are stunning, but you're able to capture um, this progression and then you hit these emotional beats. And uh, we talk a lot about, as directors, figuring out the emotional moments of the scenes. This is one of them, when, you know, when they take their masks off. What do you, when you're prepping to really know you're gonna get a shot that conveys this sort of um, uh, release at this moment, a shot well, like this? This particular, this, this particular sequence, we spent probably eight weeks figuring out Whoa. Yeah, we, because I knew I, we'd be using the Phantom. Mm -hmm. We they needed to be. We had to decide whether how opaque it was, right? How lightweight it was. We had three different three different. I believe it was three different textures. So mm -hmm. the one that gets pulled off is not the one that they're walking with. Of course, yeah, yeah, and, and all that. Um, so uh, because they all had different, you know, issues or problems. Yeah different shots so yeah. and this goes back to prep right. this is why prep. but in your in your prep you want to do that in such a way that on set if a great idea happens you're not so prepped into a corner that you can't you can't right. you, you do something else so anyway yes this was a case where those those masks went on for weeks um, <laughs> and finally, finally, uh and you purposely, in your uh, edit at least, um, belayed the first real true close-up uh, of Elizabeth Moss until this moment where yeah. her face is exposed. Everything else is very cinematic. Uh, was that part of your shot design as well, or was yeah. this something in editing you figured out? No, no, that was very much part of it. Right. Um, and then... This was, I, it was all designed, by the way, for that shot. You see, the, the, I wanted the lyricism yeah. of the movement of the those masks which those are not those obviously aren't really masks. those are just pieces of, of fabric right um, but it was all about getting to that point where they were going to be musically kind of driven. um and then uh it it ends with this amazingly emotional moment that you um um build towards and sort of again um finishing on your main character i guess how much work do you do with Elizabeth in the scene as you block and as you put it together? And, and do you shoot, shoot this close up first? Do you shoot it last? It all depends on the actor. So, you know, you were asking earlier, what is, what's the alchemy between director and actor mm -hmm. to get performances? And I would say, for me, the first words out of my mouth are, actually not the first words, the first thought is to trust them. Right. Um, you have to build the trust that they will trust you. Uh, and that, but most importantly, you need to trust them that they are doing something if they're thoughtful. I mean, I'm talking about, you know. Sure. Uh, Andrew Chu has a perfect question for this, but how do you actually develop that trust? What's your process of creating trust? Um, uh, you know, you I think the most important thing is to be honest. Right. They ask you a hard question and you don't have the answer. Just say, hmm, didn't think about that, you know? Uh, and so that you're not trying to, you're not trying to answer all things to all people. Because by the way, actors have tremendous ideas. Mm -hmm. they, they, they sit and percolate on their character. And, and you know, I remember one time I had to, um, I had to do this scene with Jeremy Irons, and I used to go in, and in part to, to, to you know, he's, he's a filmmaker, and he's himself a, he's worked with some of the best directors in the world, and so um, every day we were working together, I would go in in the morning and just to sort of tell him what I was thinking about a scene, and uh, because we didn't often, depending, sometimes we got to rehearse, but plenty of times we didn't, so to give him kind of the heads up of what I was thinking and to hear what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. So I give myself that 25 minutes or whatever to right. just 
interact. And then I remember going to him one time saying, okay, so we've got this scene to do. And I was worried about it being um, expository. And, and uh, I said, I've got, a, I've got a, an idea, but I, I don't think it's gonna, you know, I'm worried that it's not quite right for it. So I thought, let's spitball. So we spitballed back and forth. And by the time we were finished, it's one of the best scenes that, that I've ever shot. And, and it, it, because it became not about the words. Right. And it became about a whole other thing that we, we designed that morning. And it was like, oh my God, that's, you know. So it's, it's very much being crafted. And then you all automatically have his buy-in because he uh, co-authored the moment, right? He co-authored the moment. And even if he hadn't co-authored the moment, my job is to help him co-author co co the moment. Right, so that so that if I've come in with an idea that I think is maybe too radical or whatever, uh, or I think is flippin' brilliant, right. uh, they, they might not agree. It's how do you bring them on side so that they own it with you? Same with the DP, by the way, and same with with sure. the camera operator. And sometimes camera op operators, um, you know, can be absolutely brilliant. Uh, and come up with a shot. And, you know, when I mentor people, particularly when I'm mentoring a DP or whatever, I try to teach them, let people come up with ideas. It prob if they're not better than yours, right. use yours. But if they're better than yours, use theirs. Um, I am uh, monitoring the q and I see the questions I will be asking in some sort of order. Uh, we were just talking about prep, so uh, there is a, uh, a really good question. A prep on drama series is quite short. Uh, do you have a process to help ensure you get everything you need in prep? Um, uh, there, you know what, you never get everything you need. So uh, <laughs> I gave up on that a long time ago. Okay. What, you know, you just try to stay on top of the real critical things that you know are going to bite you in the ass. Right. So um, to, to push forward on the, you know, like the particular- What would they be? What would they be? Big well, schedule, or, everyone. Yeah. schedule is a big one, right? Do you have the right time? Big thing. You've got a scene that's that thick and you've got a schedule that's that, that, that's that thin. Don't go in thinking you're going to somehow create a miracle and pull it off. Right. Get the scene down to size. If you can't expand the schedule, go in and your AD is your absolute advocate there. Never let an AD, and they generally will not, hand in a schedule that is a doable schedule, that is a, it looks right, but it's right. not right. Because the two of you sync together. So you're better off to say it's a 14 day schedule and we have 10 days. Okay, everybody, let's go to work on how we make that fit. Because otherwise you will, you, you can't, it's just soul destroying to try to get through your day. And at the end of the day, the entire crew feels like they fucked up. Right. And because they haven't, we, you, they do, they, they have ownership of it, right? They can't make yeah. it. Yeah. So stack the deck for success. So the big thing is schedule versus, and then the other thing is know how to get yourself out of trouble. So you know that certain scenes are going to take more time. The emotion, so put the emotional scenes at the top of the day where you, you know, you can scramble through scene whatever. Right. And even if it's illogical in the, in the grand scheme of things, because no matter what, first scene out of the day always takes us longer. Sure. Right? We yeah. always dig in. We get great ideas. We want, suddenly want to do this little shot over here and whatever. And suddenly it's like, oh, half the day is gone. Yeah, it's, <laughs> right? So you, you end up having to scramble through the rest. I don't know whether anybody else, but that's been my experience. Rarely. Uh, I, I, I think you just wrote the book on that, uh, Barry. Yeah, I know for sure. Um, yeah, so in the prep part of it. Uh, you also want to put the expository scenes that you're, you know, you know, you can just kind of get through real quick uh, later on too, because those are the scenes you can get as well. Yeah, you know, so pick and choose your yeah. poison and, um, and so that you are able, so that also helps you with the actors, back to the mm -hmm. trust factor. And I also ask them, okay, because it, it's a totally illogical probably to do the, the close up first. But if it's a performance, an actor comes to set with the performance sitting right there. Right. And they, they're just, they're afraid of it. They're right. uh, embracing it. It's all the things, but they've been doing all this prep right. for maybe weeks sometimes. Sure. And now today's the day and it's sitting right there. So right. what do you do, right? And if they're cantankerous about it, it's only because they're, they're just dying to get that performance 
and it might be scheduled for the end of the day. And then you're, they're stuck all day waiting for that big moment. So it's important that you ask them, okay, so what do you, out of this, you know, I know this is a big scene for you. Do you want to go, we can do your close up first. Often they will say, no, I need to know what everybody else is doing. You know, sure. Or so give them the choice and then, you know, right there. So for instance, that, that moment with Elizabeth Moss, was that within the day uh, after, after you shot the approach and you're going into coverage? Yeah, in that case, um, that uh, we knew when it was going to happen. So I, I calibrated it was going to be around two o'clock. Okay. So we knew as we're heading to it. And then you give, you know, some timelines. I'm going to be coming to that next. Right. You know, just so everyone's kind of in the same place, you know, with you. Really uh, um, David Hackle, uh, our very good friend, is in the audience right now, uh, and he's a former editor as well. Uh, he asks about uh, your, your coverage specifically. Uh, are you more economical or more generous uh, the way you see I'm, I'm not economical. <laughs> <laughs> is there ever moments where it's like you have 20 minutes left in the day and you have I to get the steam? Do. Okay, so in loudest voice, I did a three page scene in 20 minutes with a steady cam operator who got the whole thing because we were forgotten and right. I had to get the scene and you know, um, so yes, I can be super efficient. I can be like a absolute, you know, um, what, what is it, someone call me the, uh, the dragon lady. You, there, stand there, right. blah, blah, blah. Camera's gonna do do, 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 It's a one -er, blah, blah, right? Seven pages, a one Um Talking, scene, but close. <laughs> talking about loudest voice uh, and talking about actors, uh, you had Russell Crowe in some of the most extraordinary um, um, makeup, uh, yes. which was uh, also, I think, um, nominated for an Emmy as well. Uh, and oh, yes, they haven't been nominated yet. No. Oh, okay. Well, let's let's knock on some wood. And by the way, and by the way, he's Canadian. Uh, oh, amazing! The makeup artist. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, when you're faced with a challenge of working with an actor who obviously has to be in hours of makeup. How do you approach scenes like this, which is, you know, I, I would imagine this is a three page scene, four page scene with him basically speaking for the entire uh, duration of it. Yeah. What, what do you do as a director to prepare an actor? Well, in particular, so this was a case also where I asked Russell uh, because he had to get, um, there was real performance in here. Yeah. Interestingly, this was the first day we shot together. Oh really, is this the first scene? First, the first day we shot. Okay, together. okay. First scene, but the first, it's close to the first scene, but not the first scene. Right. So it was, and the makeup was in still R and D. You know, it was falling off of his face, and it was uh, uh, there was lots of discovery um, as we went. But it was one of those where I said, you know, where do you want to be on the? Do you want me to come in for the close up first? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or it's in here, and he, um, he wanted to know my coverage so he knew where to, where to put it. Um, and uh, I was just very specific. I knew exactly where the cameras were gonna go. I hadn't boarded it. I hadn't predicted because- Okay, all right. Because it, it seems very- Everything's like, a matter for me. I, right. I the whole scene in each camera setup. Right. I don't go in and go, we're just gonna get this and this, unless it's obvious, you know. Sure, sure. So, and I tell the actors up front so that they know I'm going to shoot the whole scene with this because the coverage in that case is you don't, you don't know necessarily how you're right. going to I was going to join up, yeah. Um, and then uh, kind of interspread with uh, this are, are scenes that are just really cinematic and um, uh, kind of show off the way you, you, you view things. I guess um, uh, a question comes, is there a difference between directing for features as opposed to TV? You said there was, there was not, but- Well, there you know, is, I mean, sure there is, because it's, it's um, I haven't found that to be different, by the way, with schedule, because I haven't okay. done most, you know, studio movie where you go in and do two pages. Yeah. Uh, I've done indies, so you go in and you're still doing six pages, you know, right. so uh, for me, it hasn't been much of a difference. Um, um, 
you know, in terms of process. But I think today more than ever, there should not be a difference. You you go cinema, cinema, cinema. You know, right. cinema, what is by definition what is cinema for you? Um, and that's your stamp and your style. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's always scope. Look yeah. for the scope. Back off. Get out. But then of you but then you come in for that emotion. But then you come in. Yeah. yeah. The, for me, my style is extremes, which, right. which but, but make sure you play your, your scope and scale um, because, you know, the dreaded mid shot. Um, and also, by the way, uh, framing a little more exciting. You know, if you, if you don't have the scope and scale be, by definition, like that room you just showed was yep. a room. It took us forever to get an empty space in New York like that. Oh, wow. Also, oh, it wasn't the stage. No, and it was right. mediocre. Best. So what do you do? Right. You find something that's you know graphic about it and play right. the graphics right. as much as you can. Um, uh, there is a question from Lana uh, LJ. Uh, what are the characteristics of a perfect assistant director for you? I think you were kind of intimating uh, your your work with an assistant director with the schedule. But what makes an assistant director um, important uh, to you? What are the characteristics? Um, super positive. Uh, yes. Yes, because they're they're they need to prop you up too. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and quite and funny. I enjoy a good joke. It's it's the, the assistant, the the AD and I really were the ones wearing the the, the shit. You know, the uh, oh wow, that just happened. <laughs> right. uh, and you know, to, so to have someone who's your ally, yeah, um, and who will put you now, it's a tricky. It's a, in television, it's a tricky job because really they're hired often, not when you're doing pilots so much, but they're hired by the producer and they're really working for the producer. Right. And so where do they support the director? And where do they support the, you know, and, and if there's a bunch of incoming directors and, and all that. So I think it's a, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. If you can find the humanity and become friends and allies in how you get your day, um, that to me is the, and, and a creative collaborator, you know, uh, because believe me, getting one of the, one of the better, um, ADs I worked with, for example, we made sure we had a big relationship, both of us with the lead actors okay. so that he would call ahead to the actors to say, you know, we're honing in 20 minutes, um, and there would be joking back and forth and, uh, you know, just keeping running a set that is calm mm -hmm. and fair and safe. Right. That's the critical thing. And that's particularly for the actors, that they're safe. Right. They're going right. to come on set. There's not going to be chaos. That we're going to be ready for them. You know, heads up. Here they come. Let's, you know, look good. Um, uh, and, and even now uh, with COVID uh, protocols, it's going to be even more difficult. Um, uh, I don't want to get in the weeds on, on COVID, but I, you know, uh, uh, we, we briefly started to talk about post and I do want to, uh, just ask, um, of course, David Hackle is a production designer. Uh, you're the former editor, but, uh, there's a question, um, uh, from someone that, uh, asks, I was intrigued by what you said regarding shooting for the edit. Um, can you talk about your relationship with the editor and the editing process and how it may differ from features to series? Cause I think that's, uh, a very different, like with a feature, you're in, you're you're in, you're embedded uh, with series, um, not so much from the pilot perspective, but for some a lot of the directors watching right now, they'll go in for one episode. Also, yeah. Paul Paul Day, who is our um, DGC director rep, asked, "How much do you love editors? You love well, editors I, quite a lot. I love editors. Um, you live with one. <laughs> I, I live with one, and also, um, you know, they've saved my ass more than once. Yeah." Um, my goal is, listen, if you're working as an episodic director, to some degree, you're the provider of footage. The most you can do is design, and depending on who you're working with, how respectful they will be of you. Mm -hmm. A lot of showrunners and producers really want you gone. You know, they don't even really want your director's cut. Right. They, they have a relationship with the editor and depending on their relationship with you, it's the editor. So because sometimes my footage is tricky, I, I shoot a little bit with, I'll have an editing style in mind when I shoot. 
I, that has to be conveyed to the editor in, you know, um, in uh, loudest voice, it, it was a particular style of editing that I was going for. And that wasn't every editor that could pull that off. So it's trying to have a very open conversation, understanding that the editor is in a betwixt and between because mm -hmm. they're working for you in this moment. But once you're out of the room, you are done. You know, so you just have to be realistic as the director to say, okay, you know, I hope it works. Right. And if you don't like it, uh, okay, I hope you've got the coverage and the, the w different ways around it, that they will come away happy with, with the work. Now, you know, when you work with a Bruce Miller, he's super respectful of the editing process and of the directors. He even, you know, he's, he's very much like it's your floor, like he doesn't, they hand you the script. Michael Hurst hands you the script and, and you right. hand him back the show. Right. It depends on who you're working with. In the U.S., the, the U.S. network, they're a bit more um, in your face. Mm -hmm. And I don't do my best work that way. I don't know what right. anybody does. So that was a long way around to say the editor is your best friend and your worst enemy. Um, so try to make them your best friend. because, And then I call them all the time. Right. And the, back to doing your homework way back, speak to the editor. Right. What do you work in the editing room for this particular team? Especially if the se if it's seasons into the show and they've edited on the show before, at least on the on this year or season, yeah. Like this, they will never put it in the show. Yeah. They know that that actor will do this. You know what is it? You know what is it, what are the foibles of the actors? What mm -hmm. doesn't work with the actors? What are you always cutting around? The editor knows everything. They sit in the room. They hear what's going on behind them. They hear the talk. They can really help you set yourself up for success so that you're not handing in footage that where people go, oh, girl, we're going to have to, that's not the show, you know, or whatever. Right, right. Uh, it actually is a nice segue into another question that we just got in. Uh, it's been there for a bit, so I'm, I am making my way through the Q&A. Um, this is always interesting asking directors uh, at, at these sort of um, converse, in conversations with, you know, have you ever had difficulties with an actor and had to figure out uh, what they needed from you? Uh, how do you find out the solution to that? Well, the first thing you have to do is observe what's going on. Because you can have, you know, diagnosable psychological issues. Um, you know, we're talking racehorses. Sure. Right? Whether male or female, they're, they're racehorses. Um, and so, so, of course, they're... they're um, uh, they, they can be um, full of all that what comes with that mm -hmm. uh, creative genius um, being probably the number one element so I think uh, if they trust you you won't have any problem if they don't trust you then uh, you're gonna have to figure out how to, to gain their trust or not turn it into a battleground what they really need what I have found is just like I need to have a safe space to work. Mm -hmm. I work well if I think everything I'm doing is a mess, right? <laughs> uh, so is honesty and trust. Like if they, if they come out of scene and it's completely the opposite way you thought of it, it means you haven't communicated yet in, in, in far enough in advance. Mm -hmm. Like through prep, you can go in and go, I've just been thinking about this scene, you know, I was thinking about doing this kind of shot to come down and do that. What are you thinking about it? And they might, they might have a whole other idea because they've been working on it too. They've been doing the same prep you have. Right. Uh, and their idea might be worth listening to, or they might, you know, say, so it's all about control. Okay. Don't get the control issue. The minute you're fighting for control. So I, one of my techniques has been when we get into that control issue, I hand it to them. Okay, what would you like? And, uh, you know, particularly if they start directing the other actors, I try to make a joke of it, but it's like, hey, I'll, I'll do my job, you right. do your job, and we'll right. all be, right? Uh, which I say to a lot of people, you know, I, I, I'll do my job, I don't have to be the DP. Has that, has that approach worked for you? I guess, I guess, it, yeah. Of course it does. Now, it, uh, because it points out that don't, don't, don't be directing other people, you know, don't right. do, that's just, but a lot of that comes from insecurity. So if someone is afraid, mm -hmm. Uh, or they're, they're worried about their performance or their insecurity because they feel like they're not cutting it with rightly or wrongly with the people around them, uh, except oh, whatever, you know, the insecurity comes from, 
you talk to them differently. If you know that someone is barking at you, yelling at you, mm -hmm. and it's because they're afraid, I don't need to yell back at that. Yeah. I just need to let you peter out and go, all right, are we done? Right. Cool. So, right? Because I know where it's coming from. Obviously, bad behavior is part of our business, whether we like it or not. Now, with the movements and such, let's hope it gets better. Called out. And called out. But it is, we're having to keep up, you know. It, we, we, we're, it's a tough thing we're doing right. at times. It's not rocket science, and we're not saving lives. But we are doing something that is under high pressure. So sometimes we crap. Let's forgive each other for that. Right. If it's mean spirited, that's a different thing. If it's mean spirited, uh, you know, that has to be called out and stamped out. Uh, on a, a similar um, question, and uh, I, I posted this masterclass on Inc. Canada, Karen Walton's uh, Facebook group, uh, who has, has amazing writers on that. So I have a question for writers. Yannick Lowe, who I go all the way back to music videos with, asks, uh, have you worked with writers when a scene isn't flowing on the day or has, uh, uh, or that hasn't always been ironed out in prep. What happens when a scene's not working and how do you work with the writer? And you being a writer yourself, uh, what are your, some of your um, strategies to that? Well, I'm really hard on the writing before we get there because I, of course, if the worst, it's, it's, um, it's tough when it's not working on set because, and it often isn't if it hasn't been. And, and sometimes it's not working on set just because the actor comes in with a new idea and, and Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes there's all these different forces that come oh, in. And yeah. And you're going, wait a second. Uh, you know, um, so you try and pick holes in it before you get there, which is, you know, a, an annoying process, frankly, but I'm always delighted when it works better than I thought it was. Like okay. I look at some of the lines and I think they'll never, that will never come out of their mouth and be something that, you know, we can stand. Right. Um, and then when an actor can sell it, um, it's like, wow, that's actually, a, that's a better line than I thought it was. It's fantastic. Um, one but, of the things but, but when you're on set and the scene's just not working and you thought it was going to work one way, actors have brought, but you have to actually talk to the writer. What is, is there a way you go about suggesting? Well, I'm trying to identify what the problem is. Right, right. right. So what, too many words? Is it too many words? You know? Yeah, usually it's a, either a logic question, right? Or, or too much, too, too much expository. You also have to define where you're going to solve this because you get caught in a conversation that takes a, pulls an hour out of the set. Right. And it's the wrong time to have the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, are, you know, so I encourage any logic questions to come up, you know, basically you get to the floor, that's what we're shooting. Right. Now, you might have some time during lighting though, right? Once you block it. Yeah, and so exactly. So that if, if the question comes up, you go, okay, we're not going to talk about this now because it's not going to affect the blocking. The blocking is this, this, and this, and th that's where it's lighting. Now let's go talk about that. Um, uh, or I'll come to the, the trailer while they're doing your hair and we'll talk about what it is you're doing. Because right. usually the, the problem comes in that in the writing, people forget, actors can act. And so they can do what three lines of dialogue describe or are expositionally telling right. you. Right. One of the beauties about working with uh, someone like a Bruce Miller is his whole mantra is I want to take a paragraph and turn it into a word. I want to take a page and turn it into a sentence. Okay. You know, so what can you convey? So when right. I'm the writing, that's what I'm looking at going, what, what don't we need here? What can the actor do? Now, if you're allowed to do that, then on set, you're giving your actors much more to do. Right. They, that's what they do. Yeah, that's, yeah. So the words are one thing, but so it's identifying what, are the words the problem? Is the, is the, motiv is the motivation of the scene the problem? So the words are at odds and try to solve it by, another way to solve it is by blowing it up. And you're right. like, okay, what if, for example, and I did this recently, Let's do the whole scene with no words. Right. And pick out the one word that you need. And you go, huh. And out of that comes the acting of it. You go, oh, well, actually, we only need this. So you're just making them move through space, reacting to whatever the actions are. I, one time I did that on the Borgias. We had this scene, and it was a, a people, they were leaving, and there was a baby. And the baby, you know, they were, she was leaving behind her baby to her parents. Okay. 
So there were six, six adults in the scene and a baby, and we had triplets so that we could, you know, if one baby cried. Sure, sure. I also had a flamingo, some other kind of exotic bird. And swords, obviously. And swords and whatever. <laughs> like, so it's like madness, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, the, for, baby number one cries. Well, triplets, I, they're psychically connected, right? So baby number one cries, baby number two is crying, baby number three is crying. They're sure. freaking out. I, but the scene needs a baby. Like, I can't not right. have a <laughs> Finally, I realized, well, wait a second. This is amazing. The baby should be crying. So right. let's just play the scene without any of the words, try to calm the baby down while she's leaving. And it, it was great. So, you know, that was a case of having to rewrite for all the wrong reasons, but right. uh, nonetheless. But it, but it becomes poetic. Exactly. Embracing, uh, embracing the, what the set brings you. <laughs> Um, another thing I, I kind of uh, want to just talk about a little bit, because I am fascinated with your work uh, when it comes to first shots. You have an ability, first shot, yeah. well, you have an ability to tell a story um, in a visual metaphor. Uh, and unless the audience knows that Clarice Scoglin tells the entire story of the, of the episode in the first shot, um, they might not be aware. But, um, I'm going to show you a couple of first shots, and can you just tell me why you chose these images? Uh, this one's from The Loudest Voice, obviously the Roger Ailes story, um, and it starts with his death. Yeah, well, this, interestingly, um, th this went through quite a few, a few uh, changes. Right, and oh. here, I'll, I'll try to find, I actually, and this is the last shot, actually. This is why I love yeah, this the one. way you set something up is because you start with such a, 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 a singular moment and then your episode ends with the creation of yeah. Fox News, right? Um, this was very much planned. The, the other shot, we had, we had real trouble coming up with an opening scene uh, and we, uh, it was rewritten a few times mm -hmm. and we boarded the scene and um, it was actually written to be something different. Um, it was a uh, much more of a, uh, it had more narrative to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because finally the decision was let's start with his death because right. we originally start with his death. Um, so I got fascinated. So I didn't, I kind of came up with that shot on set. We, we had, I, oh, really? I wasn't sure what was going to work. Right. So I, I Here, here's, up. here's the other shot. So I'll spring it up right now. Uh, but, but go ahead. Yeah. So you you, you just were shooting coverage, basically. Oh, so, yeah. So I gave myself the tools. And this was really the first image that strikes you. We really designed that shot, and I we boarded it, and I I you know I really focused on what this was going to be. I wanted a floor that was going to reflect and all that. Two, so we did two faced. Shot. Basically, it's the metaphor of being two faced, and yeah, there's always yeah. yeah. And so um, we did that. We shot that first, mm -hmm. and then we, then we played. And the so the um, because he was supposed to trip and fall. It was this whole thing, and Russell didn't love it. And I was ha we were having trouble with it. But we had said we would shoot it. And anyway, so then I had the Phantom, and so we shot the pills. I knew that we needed the the cane, mm -hmm. and when the cane bounced, mm -hmm. oh, did I freeze? Uh, it's okay. It's because I'm just switching through. I can hear you though. Oh, okay, as long as you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so uh, the count, the cane bounced, and I realized, oh my god, that's that's a, it was beautiful. So then, now we carved ourselves out at least an hour to be able to play. Right. So that's one of those cases where I just stacked the deck for success. Here, let me let me try to share a screen one more time, and maybe it'll unfreeze you. Who knows? Um, I don't know. So oh. We might have just lost your video feed, but I still hear you, Kari. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Can you see uh, what we're looking at right here? I'll try and refresh. Maybe. Um, so what I'm showing you is uh, this is the opening shot to your um, uh, Handmaid's Tale. Um, and this is, um, I believe it's episode 110, Night. Um, and what I love about this shot is it's bright it's in your face um you know you have the the handmaids coming up the stairs but what i realized when i actually compared this to your last shot is that the arc of the window completely is 
the very dark brim of Elizabeth Moss's um, uh, handmaid's cap um, at the end. And I guess just as a cinephile, I, I'm wondering, you know, is, was that on purpose? Um, I, sadly, I can't see your images. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. If, if, I you, sound, if I signed out and signed back in, would that work, do you think? Uh, let's, let's ask the technology uh, people that are uh, uh, listening to us right now. Um, Hans and uh, Ryan, do you think, yeah, why don't you, why don't you start, stop your video and see if it comes back in? Okay, let me just see, because I'm, 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 I think I've yeah. cracked. Okay, but if you can hear me, that's fine. Okay. Um, I can tell you uh, as much as... Why don't, you, why don't you try stopping your camera? Uh, like, just press stop video and then yeah, start no, it again. I, I've crashed. I, I can't oh, okay. Yeah, oh, geez. So I would have to, if, I, if it actually crashes, I'll have to sign out. <laughs> oh, we'll wait, let you back in. No, it's not. I suddenly thought I had maybe has something, but... Um, uh, as much yes. as much of my opening shots are designed as they are found. Mm -hmm. So, meaning, I like going into that that shoot with Russell. I knew what one of the shots would be, which mm -hmm. was background. that was absolute. The other shots, I didn't know, okay. but I knew that I wanted to, what I wanted to shoot, and that what I would find something in there. Right. And then at, on set, you start to see it and you go, oh, that'll be, that's one, that's one. And maybe if you have all the right tools and all the right props, you'll discover something else. Right. And you couldn't have thought of it because, you know, you're in the set, you're in the moment and it's a whole other. Why don't, why don't you try logging out, logging back in? I know it's, it's kind of, uh, just, it's 11.24, but I think we can go for another, you know, 15, 20 minutes if you're up right, for it. I can do. I'll, I'll um, be and while you're doing it, I'll just spritz um, to the audience and um, okay, yeah. So log okay. log out, and then uh, Ryan or Hans will let you back in. So log completely out and then log back in. Uh, folks at home, uh, stay with us. Kari Skoglin uh, is going to uh, rejoin us. Um, do you, do you see the little leap thing at the bottom, Kari? Oh, maybe it's just yeah, it's just completely just frozen. Um, so this is, uh, this is Zoom, this is live Zooms, and this is us uh, uh, having a master class uh, with Kari Skoglin. Uh, and uh, we're just waiting for her to rejoin us. Um, you know, the one, the one thing I, I think when you meet a, a filmmaker that has, uh, oh, Hans is here. Just to let you know that we're working on the technical challenges um, and we'll get Kari back as soon as we can. Yeah, I, I, I just, what I, what I love by uh, going back into her work and, and watching uh, her episodes, um, you know, leading up to this, this masterclass is, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of the stuff that she does is found or, or magic moments, but there's such construction to her work uh, that I, I just find, you know, really, uh, uh, I don't know, extraordinary. So as she comes back, we'll be, uh, talking about uh we'll be talking about that but um how you doing hans i'm <laughs> well hey well, you know that housekeeping stuff you do at the end you want to you want to talk about it right now well you uh, have me on no no okay um <laughs> but what uh, i did want to say is that that i've often said to kari and to you that 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 the ep her episode of house of cards i think is one of the greatest episodes of television ever and i know that you're, you're going to touch on it shortly um, yeah. but in terms of construction in terms of in, in terms of the sheer this the, the sheer sort of creativity the directorial element behind that episode is truly extraordinary nothing is left left to chance it's all about story it's all about character and it's constructed from the very first moment to the very last moment and that's that's really who she is and what she does so. i think it's i think it's also uh interesting that you know kari's obviously one of our um uh, most amazing directors uh, and finding sort of just international uh, acclaim and um, but yet she still has the heart of an independent filmmaker you know Absolutely. it's like at the heart of it it's it's like you got 20 minutes left go you have <laughs> you have Russell Crowe you know <laughs> um, let's see if she can get back in uh, 
for those of uh, you at home, we are just waiting for Kari to uh, come back. She does live in one of the most amazing places, but it's all concrete. So um, uh, it might be a little bit of an uh, issue with uh, her um, internet signal. Um, and uh, yeah, I've uh, been having a good week. It's been, um, it's been busy. It's been um, really great to hear from so many DGC members um, for the past several weeks, uh, obviously. The, the times we living are uh, the times we're living in are, are tumultuous. A lot of things are happening um, every single day. Seems like ten years sometimes. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that uh, was was kind of a great um, uh, thing that happened this week is uh, Tim Southern, our president, um, announced R.T. Thorne as the uh, BIPOC members uh, DGC committee chair. Um, so I think um, as we move through these times, uh, it's going to give us opportunities for uh, our members to um, sort of step up and engage. And, um, you know, RT is a leader. Uh, he has some awesome ideas, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, uh, his, his plan as we go forward. Um, and also, we have an update. Uh, Carolyn Godin. Hey, Carolyn. Uh, Rogers has crashed four times today, apparently. So if she's on Rogers, this might be a thing. Did well, we, uh, why don't I do my, my last bit now and we'll see if that gives us enough time to get Kari back. Sure. Um, what I usually do is uh, obviously thank, uh, I thank Warren and Kari and thank you, Warren, so much. Thank, thank my dad for watching. My dad's watching this. And, Roy. Uh, <laughs> Roy Sonoda. Absolutely amazing. Thanks, Roy. Uh, <laughs> next week, on Tuesday, we've got uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe picture editor Jeffrey Ford uh, talking to DGC all day. It's going to be an amazing conversation. He is one of the people who created the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So join us on Tuesday. And on Thursday, we've got groundbreaking award-winning DGC director Michelle Latimer uh, talking about her incredible work. Um, as a director, as a showrunner, as a writer. Um, so Trickster. It, Trickster is, I can't wait. It, looks, it, it sounds so awesome. An amazing series. Yeah. We're planning on, on carrying on until August 6th, at which point we're going to go on a bit of a hiatus with this Masterclass series um, to make room for festival season coming in. And, um, but still thinking about possibly carrying this on. It's been a huge success. Uh, and there's Kari. She's back. I'm back. Has everyone has everyone gone? Are we still on? Still no, watching? it's a packed house, Kari. No, Everybody's no one's there. moved. No one's moved okay, at all. Total meltdown. <laughs> way. Uh, I am not going to jinx anything by bringing up a, a, a screen share again. Oh, I don't think it was you. I think it was my my machine. I, oh, I, really? Okay. Uh, yeah, my machine crashed. Nothing to do with you. Um, but we were talking about uh, first and last shots, and I know that a lot of things are sort of found on set or found in the edit. Um, but uh, is there a level of thinking when it comes to... Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I, I start every project with what's the first image and what's the last image. Right. I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up one. Uh, it is from House of Cards. Uh, it's, it's an image that I think uh, just tells an entire story uh, uh, in one, yeah. in one way. Uh, here we go. And it's, uh, the top is the opening image. Yeah. And the bottom is the end image. And is this constructed? It can't be by accident. No, it was not. It was, um, this was a very, tr this was one, again, one where it was very hard to find the opening image. We went around in circles um, uh, for a while, well, because um, there was all, all kinds of bigger political things we were trying to say and this and that. And then after we shot the, the image in the kitchen, um, then it occurred, oh, wait a second, we don't have to do the bigger political stuff. Right. It can be the, you know, this, the, the human story. The, right. Uh, most and are, are, in the top image, were those chairs specifically moved to do that? Because I don't think chairs on Air Force One are positioned that way. <laughs> yeah, no, they were, 
absolutely put like that. Although those are just the swivel chairs. They're not, okay, um, okay. it's around a boardroom. And of course they're all sets, right? right that right. The two of them are sets. Right. But yeah. And, that was, and, uh, and obviously the story point is the uh, third gentleman the in the third, scene below in, yeah. that completely wedges. So, and that, so that was a case, like you're, you, I, you never, I don't think you land on an opening or closing image easily. So, you know, you can let yourself off the hook a little bit that it will emerge or, or trust the process that it will mm -hmm. emerge out of the process. Cause you're, if you're constantly thinking about, you know, you're constantly trying to find it. Sometimes it's obvious and you can't, you know, you just, you think that's, that's the image. So, although I recently had one where I had I big design to get the opening image and it was a big set piece and it was a big thing. And at the end of the day, it's not going to be the opening image. Right. You know? uh, this is, I think, the funniest opening image uh, that <laughs> yeah, I found of yours. Empire. My book. Boardwalk Empires. Yeah, which, <laughs> which basically just segues into, a, a, you know, a fairly funny um, uh, scene in the bedroom. But it totally yeah. sets up. Um, With the Charlie Cox, yeah. Was, so are these things written? Was this written this way? Was House of Cards no. written that way? No. Is that a directorial choice that you made? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of pitching ideas like that to your showrunner and your writers, is it, is it just a fairly easy? It depends. Uh, it depends on the, the situation you're in. I've been in situations where you have a producing director who's sitting there watching you block. I thought I will never do that again. Uh, you know, that's so punitive, right. so ridiculous and, right. um, and frankly, um, uh, disrespectful of our right. position. Um, uh, so well, you might find yourself in that situation, in which case, you know, you have to find a way to work with it. Uh, in which case, you know, every idea that you have, you have to run through somebody and then they kill it, you know, or whatever you're into it, one of these. For the most part, if I'm in a situation where I feel there is going to be tremendous scrutiny, like in that case, you know, you, uh, you, 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 you yeah. know, no. that's then, why they hired you. The way he writes, the way um, he writes is very spare. You right. know, you basically there's there's the dialogue, and then there's, but you know what the set's going to. You know, I had the set built for, for specifically for the shots. I guess somewhere on the line it was conveyed maybe that I was going to do that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't remember. Right. Um, so I think it, what's important is communication, communication, communication. So you, yeah. so that nobody has a surprise, particularly a bad surprise. If you make a friend of the, uh, the you know, communicate. Just to say, hey, I've got this great idea for an opening. Be prepared, though, that they will say, no, oh, I don't know. You have to go with something else right. because you're stuck, right? If they've said no, and they're not going to let you, if, if, you know, if you put yourself out there, otherwise you can just do it. That's where it comes back to prepping, right. making sure the editor will tell you uh, what works. And by the way, the other person to prep with is the AD, is you know, all the people who work around the the project and have history with it and know what works does at the end. Uh, so that would be one where you go, all right, you know, you, you can tell whether the scrutiny is on you or not. Right. And if it's gonna be on you, then you better kind of check it out. Right. Uh, and if it's not gonna be on you, go free for it and go for it. Right. Uh, I'm, I just got the text that we should uh, do a bit of a, a power q and A. I'm going to try to get through some of okay. these questions. I'll be back. Um, uh, some of them are pretty, pretty, pretty heavy. So I'm going to. Um, I'll be quick. Couple, I'm going to couple two to, together. Uh, Nadia Day, hey Nadia, asks, uh, "Hi Kari, what roadblocks did you face when you were starting out? Also, we worked together on the big stand still in Vancouver. Thanks." And I'm going to couple that with um, another question, uh, which is your opinion with the implications brought to our industry uh, by COVID-19. Um, and I don't know exactly what that means, if that's COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, or just being, you know, um, cooped up. Uh, I, and the question is, what hope does a young white female director have? Uh, and I guess that's the question of, you know, it's different now than when you were starting out, but what is, what is, what do you think the landscape is uh, coupled with, um, uh, uh, Nadia's question, well, well, the, okay. roadblocks. For all, the, for all the roadblocks, I first of all, invest in yourself. So I, you know, uh, 
my first movie with Paul Rudd. I, I raised the money. Uh, I put some of my own money in. You know, I never let that get in the way. Um, so invest time. Sweat equity is the best thing you can invest. Right. Uh, the other thing I'd love to stop talking about are all the barriers. Sure. Obviously, there's barriers. It's yeah. a, a tough business to get into. It's tough to have people trust that they can give you $10 million or $100 million and come out the other end with something that will sell. So Sometimes to, $250 million, hmm, maybe. So, well, <laughs> so you've got to be in a place where you, where you can exude. People will have confidence that you are going to right. um, uh, you know, be a reasonable person to deal with uh have a product at the end that they that is showable and all that stuff right so um you know you have any color or gender is going to have to serve that master like it or not yeah so i think also i never really focused on the barriers so were there barriers absolutely are there barriers now absolutely and uh, as many of my barriers come from women as they do men so okay. I, I would like to point that out. Women are not each other's best friends in this world. Right. So um, uh, I would say, take that, you know, literally just go, eh, I'm going to focus on just getting the job done. Right. Focus on the story. not focus on the barriers. And that will help you, I think, more than, than, um, than trying to ramrod your way through the, the closed doors. Um, you know, Luke, Luke Fox has a question about uh, the position that you're in, uh, that you've now reached a point where you have more choice in selecting your projects. What do you actually look for in projects now uh, in, in, in the writing of the script? Um, and what do you find interesting? What draws you into these things? Well, I have a, a checklist. About oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that they, you I actually have a, you actually have a checklist? I literally have a checklist. Okay. Um, and uh, I can... I, I, I can choose to ignore the checklist, meaning it has seven out of 10 and it needs to be shorn up. But essentially what I look for now, and I think I've always looked for, but um, more than ever, uh, the projects are coming to me that, fit, that have this in them, uh, you know, is something that will enlighten, something that moves the needle, uh, something that I feel uh, is important to tell. I'm sort of at a time in my life, and I think it's probably true of, you know, to do fluff, I'm, I feel like I'm wasting my time because right now it's about communicating. I don't have to solve the problem. One of the things I learned when I was doing documentaries and um, I was prepping a documentary and I spoke to a documentary filmmaker out of um, Australia who had done a similar topic. And I said, what do you think you got right? And what do you think you got wrong? And she said, you know, I think I was trying to answer the question and I think I should have just been putting it out there for the debaters to debate. Mm. And um, so I look at the projects for that, you know, that uh, it creates a debate, it opens doors to a different way of thinking. Um, is it going to be a positive experience? I mean, those are a big part of the checklist. Don't think forever, I made this mistake, not once, not twice, but continually. And I've finally stopped. But um, if you uh, if you lie down with dogs, expect to get fleas. Right. Check out the people you're going to work with. Right. If they're assholes, they don't stop being assholes. And you will not, no matter how good you are at politics or whatever, the likelihood of you coming out unscathed is next to zero. So, you know, be careful who you choose to work with. Right. And the quality of life and all that. So it's it's a job that is so consuming. Um, you know, you want to be careful with your time, how you spend your time. Uh, two last things. Uh, you, you, you almost touched upon it, but um, uh, the idea of mentorship. Uh, I tell this story when I talk to film students or emerging directors. I tell the story of going to my first Guild event. I think it was your first or second um, conference of creatives. Uh, it was at some sort of Hall for the DGC, where I don't know, in a cocktail lounge or something, maybe TIFF. Um, you were, you looked stunning. You were all dressed up. You were Kari Skoglin, the amazing film director that I, I, I didn't quite know. Uh, but I guess you must have heard of me or like someone said, hey, this, this guy just joined the guild. He's new. Uh, why don't you uh, uh, welcome him in? And you came up to me uh, and we kind of knew each other, but you said to me, Warren, 
all this pee and poo fart comedy stuff, what do you really want to do? And, <laughs> and I said, well, Kari, actually, honestly, to tell you the truth, I, I think I, I gravitate towards dramatic directing. It's just no one's ever given me the chance. And you said to me, you can do better. And I needed to hear those words from a filmmaker like you at that exact moment because uh, I needed to hear it. You know, if it was just one of my friends, we kind of say that off the cuff or whatever, but it doesn't have that weight. Um, what in your head, and, and since then you've become not just a friend, but or not just a mentor, but a, 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 I consider you a very good friend and you helped me so much. What is the, what is the um, value of mentorship once you get to a certain point? Uh, I think we all need it. I, I have my mentors. I call up people, I, you know, if I face a, a tricky situation, um, I have my mentors who don't even know they're my mentors. Right. Right. You know, uh, which uh, I, I, I have in my head, how would they do this, right? Or how would they think about this? Or, right. you know, so um, I think you can choose a lot of mentors uh, to inform you project specific, but then also life choice specific. Mm -hmm. um, and and kind of use them as, as points of reference and guideposts. And I guess the, what, you know, it's funny. I remember that moment because- um, Oh, I, you do? Because I thought you would never remember no, this. No, 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 I remember. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't say anything like that. Uh, We've actually never but, talked about this, but I do yeah, talk I about it a lot. Without, uh, <laughs> having thought about it. But here's a guy who's so talented and, and doing so much work. And um, uh, obviously has the chops. And I worried when I saw it, saw your work, that you were shortchanging yourself. That's all. And that was, and which is why it, I felt, I don't know why I, it was very arrogant of me to think that my words would help you, but <laughs> I felt like, um, and I think we did know each other a little bit because uh, I'd gone to one or two. Um, something of yours, uh, presentation or something. Yeah, we, we, yeah, it wasn't out of the blue. It was just wasn't yeah, like, hey, I'm we're... sorry, you can do yeah. better. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, boy, you gotta do better, dude. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I might have, but I don't think so. No, but um, yeah. Uh, because, I, you know, the goal of anybody is really encouragement. Yeah. And you need to hear it from people, you know. Yeah. I don't get much encouragement in my day. I don't know about any other director, but I, it's not that often that people come up and go, wow, good day, you know? Usually it's all about the problems of the day or the problems we're going to have or how you fucked up something or other or whatever, whatever. When there's, I live for those moments on a set where you've created this alchemy and everybody goes, well, we did that together, you know? Right. That's what you do. So if you see someone who you feel like has so much potential and they're getting caught, work begats work. Yeah. You know, and so you have to choose, start to make the choices and what you're doing and you're going to be. Uh, you made me, you made me make a fringe you know. play, Kari. You made me make a fringe play. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Turn down, you know, uh, summer of episodic TV to uh, lose money doing a fringe play, but it was the best summer of my life. So. Well, but, and, and you came out uh, having learned oh, yeah. something that you brought to the next thing. And that's, I think, you know, we forget, oh my God, what COVID has taught us, if it hasn't taught us anything else because it made us all stop and think, right. is that the world can change so suddenly for you and for all of us, yeah. whether it be a health issue or, a, or something so out of our control and all that, that time is so precious that really it's not about, you know, it's not about the grind. Suddenly, for me too, I, I, I work all the time. And for the first time, I was sitting back going, uh, wow, well, I'm, I'm kind of on hold here for a second. And it's been really great to, to yeah. thankfully, you know, have not the COVID health yeah. issues haven't come yeah. my way. So I, I applaud you for having the, the guts to um, sit back and kind of do a career shift. Um, the last question, uh, and I'm just prepping hands to come in after this, but um, uh, this one uh, came in from Aravind Primorel. Uh, I hope I got that right. Uh, hi, I'm Aravind Primorel from India. Uh, my passion is to make films, and there is there are thousands like me. But there is a time when people like me are so scared and can't take a proper make a proper decision whether to go uh, with our passion or to help our family by doing some jobs out here because um, uh, what I actually consider is 
these jobs as soul killing jobs. But because of our responsibilities and commitments and also considering fi uh, family financials, somehow it's hard to make a decision whether to chase your passion or not. Uh, the question to you is, have you ever struggled with this? Do you remember a moment when you finally stepped out from your fears uh, and were willing to face whatever the way, uh, w to face the way to achieve your passion? Um, do, you have, do you have any words on this? Wow, what a thoughtful question. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Listen, that's a tough one. I, I had to, we didn't get into it, but I also had to raise a family yes. uh, while directing and, um, and following my passion which meant tremendous sacrifices on the part of my family, um, as well as me on behalf of them. Um, I think uh, not knowing your circumstances, um, which somehow I think you have to serve your passion mm -hmm. because um, you will forever regret not doing that. It, and understand the sacrifice that that might mean. Now, having said that, you also can do it smartly. So I managed, thankfully, luck plays a big role in all this. Um, and you, you start to create your own luck a little bit, but you know, start attending the conferences. Start, you know, you can do a lot while you're still, you know, Don't you, you still have a job at Starbucks, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and you can also decide at some point what way you're going to get into the film business, depending on, you know, like, let's say, you know, many different scenarios. There's many ways in. You can become an investor if you became a banker and, and decided, okay, I'm going to, you can also, you can volunteer at the, maybe not this year, but the Toronto Film Festival and start yeah. understanding the world. You can get inside the world and see what it is, where your fit is without giving everything up. So you can be smart about it and strategic about it. Um, and, and, and I think that's really uh, the route to anybody's success is really follow your strategy on the path. So you're not just being frivolous about it, right. but you're being structured. And then, then I think it's probably pretty possible to follow your dream. Yeah, I, I just think um, the film industry is one of those industries where you can show up with n nothing, with no um, um, experience, but just if you're tenacious, if you uh, are curious, if you're a good person, you can find your way on a crew with a team, tell a story. Well, and you can intern, you can intern at companies, you can take courses. I took a lot of courses at Ryerson. I, I audited a lot of, of actors' courses um, uh, because, you, and you can find them. So you can it, embed yourself in the community and understand the community because it, it is quite particular. Um, you can uh, get inside organizations like the Academy and like the DGC and, and other, there's um, other, uh, you know, WIFT. Uh, there's all kinds of organizations so that you can get into the conversation and understand that if you're if you're that far outside the industry, mm -hmm. to get your way to slowly maneuver your way closer, yep. and then that's where mentors and friends and so on come in because you start making films for you know nothing yeah. uh, because a student and there's a lot of websites by the way where um, student filmmakers are uh, looking for for you know people Scripts. to have some fun. yeah you carry yeah. stuff and yeah. you get into the, the student track the student filmmaking track which only leads you to people who are going to be in the industry yeah. so there's a lot of ways in if you get creative about it uh and uh maybe you just might show up to your first dgc uh, event and Kari Scoglin will come up to you and say you can do better uh, <laughs> and, and with that i hand so it back to i hand it back to hans engel Warren, thank uh, you for being such a gentleman oh my goodness uh, <laughs> it was lovely Thank you for uh, coming back with us after that little tech glitch. I appreciate it. Oh, my God. Time. My computer like is steaming at this point. <laughs> Thanks well, for staying with the program. Thanks to both of you so much. And, and, and an amazing note to end because this whole series, the Masterclass series that we've been running, is about community. It is about outreach. It is about keeping people, keeping the community together in this crazy circumstance that we yeah. find ourselves in. And, and building those bridges and keeping the conversation going. So thank you both. Two of my favorite filmmakers on the planet, Warren Sonoda, Kari Stoglund, thank you so much for being with us. Oh my God, it was great. Really, thank you for inviting me.
And we'll, uh, awesome. we'll do it again sometime. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll do it live once yeah. again. <laughs> right. There'll be drinks and, and good food to follow. Exactly. I've already told everybody about next week with Jeffrey Ford and Michelle Latimer, Tuesday and Thursday. So join us for that. Be well, uh, be kind. Thank you so much. And, and be safe. Yes, be, be safe, safe out there. Have a great night. Thanks. So much. Thank you. Love you guys.